Well, good morning, Heartland. It's great to be here with you this morning. And as always, I'm excited to dive into God's Word and, and study it with you today. If your family has been anything like my family, the last several weeks have provided an opportunity for an awful lot of family movie nights. We're not going out with friends and we're not going to different events across the state of Nebraska. We're mostly hunkering down with the people in our family unit. And so every Saturday night, my whole family will pop our popcorn and we'll get our soda. We'll grab maybe a box of candy. We'll pull the blankets up over us, turn off the lights in the house, and we'll have a family movie night. And over the course of this last week, a, a familiar movie scene continues to come into my mind time and, and time again. And that scene uh, is from the movie Aladdin. Now, most of you have seen the movie Aladdin before. It's the story about a, a poor young man who's living on the streets. He's homeless. He has very few family, no family, and, and very few friends in his world. He's, he's down on his luck. But Aladdin, by chance, happens upon a magic lamp. And as he rubs that magic lamp, a, a genie comes out of that lamp and he gives him three wishes to make his wildest dreams come true. And as we're following along with the story of Aladdin, we see the choices that he's making. We see him decide to pursue the princess of the kingdom, Princess Jasmine. And one night, Aladdin takes his magic flying carpet and he flies up to the balcony of the palace and he's talking to Princess Jasmine about how great he is. And she sees this flying carpet and she's blown away. And Aladdin climbs onto his flying carpet and he says, do you want to go for a ride? And, and she looks at him uh, skeptical, as you would be if you were seeing a flying carpet. And she says, is it safe? And Aladdin reaches out his hand to Jasmine and he says, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Throughout the coronavirus pandemic, I don't know a single person whose life hasn't been shaken significantly in some regard. Whether your job has been turned upside down, whether you've had a relationship that you haven't been able to invest in that has been altered as a result of the coronavirus, maybe you've had someone in your life that's had to, to quarantine and you haven't been able to see them for the past nine to ten weeks. Perhaps you're like me and you've had someone close to you who've, who's passed away in the last couple of weeks in the midst of the coronavirus. No matter where you are in the world or, or what your life stage is, the coronavirus has, has taken our world and it's turned us, it's turned it on its head. And if, I, if you would have walked up to me before the coronavirus struck and you would have asked me, you would have said, Sam, do you trust in God? My answer instantly, unequivocally, would have been, yes, of course I trust in God. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my friend. I trust in Him. But as Pastor Zeke talked about a couple of weeks ago, the coronavirus, in many ways, has acted as both a mirror and a lens. It's acted as a mirror in the sense that it's a reflection of what's going on in our own hearts, in our own lives. And it's acted as a lens in the way that allows us to look more at Jesus. For my life, the coronavirus has, has really acted even more than a mirror. It's, it's been more like a, a microscope or a magnifying glass that's shining light into places that I didn't even really know were there. And so most of us this morning, if we ask the question, do you trust Jesus? The answer to that question is offhand is going to be, yes, of course I do. But what I wonder is if we analyze our emotions over the course of the last 10 weeks and we analyze fears that we have felt, does that paint the same story of do you trust in Jesus? Because we are in unprecedented times. And though we've been struggling through this pandemic, for a significant period of time now, we certainly don't know what life is going to be like on the other end. And in days like these, with the uncertainty as it is, God is reaching out His hand to us and He is asking, do you trust me? Do you trust me with your future? Do you trust me with your finances? Do you trust me with your family? Do you trust me with your friends? Do you trust me with your life. 
This morning we're going to be digging into a passage that asks that question. We're going to see the disciples are, are really asking the same thing. Do we trust Jesus? We're going to study a, a familiar passage, one that, that may have been the very first passage that you looked at when you were in Sunday school as a child. We're going to be studying about Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000. And as we look at that passage, we're going to be reading in John chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, dust off those family Bibles and open up with me to John chapter 6. Before, as you're doing that, just to give you a little bit of a backstory, the book of John is a tremendously interesting book. It's the fourth of four Gospels, and the Gospels are the stories that tell about the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of those are called the Synoptic Gospels. And they're called that because the stories that are shared in that book are tremendously similar. They might be told from a little bit of a different perspective or highlighting a a different element of, of what actually happened that day, but the stories are almost all the same. But John is completely different than that. In fact, John, 93% of the book of John is not found in the different stories of the Gospels. It's not that John is making up stories or, or he's telling us something different, but it's clear that he has a different purpose for his book. Surprisingly, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that is in all four of the Gospels. And when you see something like that, we have to ask the question, why would this be the one miracle that every single gospel writer includes in their story about Jesus? The reason it's in every single gospel is because it's hugely significant in how we view Jesus and how we answer the question, can we trust him? Let me give you a spoiler alert. We can trust him. And the disciples find that out as we get through this story and they make a wonderful decision at the end of this passage that we're going to study this morning. We are going to see that Jesus is our provider. He was the provider for the disciples then, and he's the provider for us today. So open up your Bibles again with me, and we're going to read from John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. John 6, 1 says, After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the sea. And a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Jesus went up to the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing what a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? And this he was asking, he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. And Philip answered him, and he said, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to even receive a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? And we see right off the bat at the beginning of this story that the disciples see a significant problem that's coming their way. They're in the midst of a crisis. And Jesus comes to Philip, particularly, and he says, Philip, where should we buy bread? Well, Why does Jesus ask Philip in particular that question? He asked Philip that question because Philip was the local of the area. He was from a village called Bethsaida, which most likely was the closest village to where uh, Jesus and his disciples were at that period of the time. So Philip was a local. He was the expert. If anybody knew where they could find and buy bread, Philip was the man to be able to answer that question. But obviously Jesus wasn't interested in whether Philip knew if there was a local subway. Jesus was interested in whether Philip trusted in him. And Philip responded in a way that I think is very similar to how we would respond. When faced with a crisis, Philip started counting. Just for your reference, one denarius is about the equivalent of one single day's wage for a hard-working man. And so Philip is looking at all these people coming and he's analyzing the question that Jesus just asked him about where can we buy these people bread. And Philip starts counting in his mind, we would need 200 
denarii to feed that many people, even one bite of bread. We don't have close to enough money to be able to take care of these people and the problem that we're facing that day. When the crisis was in front of Philip, the first thing he did was start counting his money. And what does that show you about where he was placing his hope? The second person that we see at the beginning of this story is Andrew, who happened to be Simon Peter's brother. And, and Andrew, I, I relate to his character in this story because I think Andrew was a problem solver. He saw the crowd of people coming. He heard Philip saying they didn't have enough money. And so even if they didn't have money for bread, there wasn't anywhere that they could buy bread, Andrew said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find a way to solve this problem. But all he came back with was two fish and five loaves of bread. And I love uh, when you study the, the Greek of this passage, how it really breaks it down even more. When it says two fish, it uses the Greek word opsarian, which, which is not the word for a, a normal sized fish. When I originally read this story, I picture two fish and five loaves. I think of two fish that somebody like Darren Brumbaugh would pull out of his lake, a big bass or some other type of fish that could feed you know, one, two, three, four people. But, but the Bible highlights that's not even what this was. These weren't even big fish. The word opsarian means small, tiny minnows. And so it's highlighting the insignificance of what Andrew had found. Not only did he find a couple of small fish, but it, the Bible, John highlights the fact that they were barley loaves. Well, barley was the cheapest, least desirable type of bread that you could possibly have. It's what the poor people were eating. And so even though Andrew was a, a problem solver and he went out to do anything that he could, he came back with next to nothing. So how can we learn from the responses of these two disciples? Let's talk about Philip first. When Jesus asked him where he could find bread, did you notice that Philip didn't even answer his question? The first thing he said was, even if there was a place to find bread, we don't have enough money. When the coronavirus brought uncertainty in our world, the first place that many of us were prone to run for security and for safety was in our finances. We were asking the question of, do we have enough money in our bank account to get us through? If we've learned anything through this, we've learned that money is a shallow well to drink from when we're pursuing security. Many people in the United States experienced that firsthand over the last nine weeks, right? If you look at the statistics, in the last nine weeks, almost 39 million Americans have filed for unemployment. 39 million, that's t almost 25% of the entire United States workforce has filed for unemployment. Three months ago, everything in life felt solid. It, it felt safe. Unemployment was lower than it has ever been. Anybody who was willing and able and desiring to work had an opportunity to find a job. And suddenly, after just a few weeks, all of that had melted away. If that teaches us anything, is that money is a poor savior. Proverbs 23, 5 says, Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. I love that proverb, and I love how it paints the picture of money can truly fly away. And if we're placing that as our source of security, we're going to be disappointed. Our world will tell us that if you want to find the source of life or of hope, of security, find money. But we know that's a bad place to rest our hope. So what can we learn about Andrew from, this, from his response to the crisis? As I said earlier, I, I sympathize with Andrew. I think he was the problem solver of the bunch. He was a person who wanted to go out. They, he said, we, we don't have any money. We don't have any bread. And he said, well, I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm still going to try to pursue a way out of this crisis. And he was a problem solver. And, and that wasn't the problem with what Andrew did. It was a good thing that he went out to solve the problem. But we still see one issue with Andrew's response. And that is what he did when he came back. After he realized he was only able to find two small fish and five small barley loaves, Andrew came back and his response is insightful. 
He said, what is so little for a crowd that is so big? And he started off, Andrew started off with these great intentions to solve a major problem, but when he quickly realized that even his own ingenuity and problem-solving skills weren't going to be able to, to save the day, he ended up dejected because he wasn't able to find a solution to the problem. One thing that we have to point out about Andrew is anywhere in that story did he go to Jesus and ask for help? Or did he go to Jesus and ask for specific guidance on how he could get through that problem? Andrew was relying on his own abilities to be able to solve this problem. And what happens when we can't solve problems by ourselves? What happens when our best laid plans fall desperately short? As I think about Philip's response and and Andrew's response, an image comes to my mind about my favorite deer stand. Now that might sound like a funny transition or a funny illustration. Bear with me for a second as I explain this. But my favorite deer stand and and probably the favorite deer stand of, of every hunter in our family is a stand by the name of the beginner stand. And it's called the beginner stand because it's where the beginning of our love for hunting happened. The first stand that my brother shot his first deer many, many years ago It was the first stand that my dad shot, the family's first wall hanger. So a deer that was big enough that you could could make a mount of it and put it on the wall, tell the story to everybody who passed by. This is a a stand that has a lot of significance and meaning to our family. And in the beginner stand, it has this long 15-foot wooden ladder that carries you up into the notch of a tree. And 20 years ago, that ladder was really strong. I could climb up that ladder, I could climb down that ladder, and I didn't have any questions of whether, I'd been, I, whether I would be safe. But over the last 20 years, as you would expect for a wooden ladder, it's, it's succumbed to the elements and it started to rot. And now I wouldn't want to put my worst enemy to climb up that ladder today. And in a similar way, when we depend on our finances, And then when we depend on our own ingenuity, those things might be able to hold us up for a time. They might present to us a sense, a false sense of security. But long, but but sooner or later, as we've seen with this coronavirus pandemic, and as we've seen in this passage today, those things are going to rot. And sooner or later, those things are going to fail to provide us a stable source of of security. The coronavirus pandemic has shaken our normal foundations and it's found them wanting. And as we move on through this passage, we're going to see that Jesus wants to teach his disciples that there is a place that's much greater for them to place their trust. So as we keep uh, going in this passage, we're going to read on in verse 10. Jesus said to the people, said to the disciples, have the people sit down. There was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, and likewise also all of the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, Jesus said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up. And they filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. There's so many things that you could pull out of just those couple of verses about what is Jesus trying to do by feeding this huge group of people. And we know the passage is really clear. It says that there were 5,000 men. In reality, because those men were traveling with their families for Passover at that time, there was probably twenty to 25,000 people who were in that crowd that day. That is a huge number of people that is gathered, and especially huge when you think about how all of them were fed with two small fish and five loaves. And we've heard that story before many times, but I want us to stop just for a moment and think about how much food it would take to feed 25,000 people. 
the best way for me to think about in that in my mind is to think about family Thanksgiving at our house. Sometimes we'll have up to 30 people from all across Nebraska come to the family Thanksgiving and you walk into the room and it is filled with food for 30 people. Think about how much food it would take to feed 20,000, 25,000. And these weren't people who, who showed up with full bellies. They didn't have anything. When Andrew went and searching back and forth to find food, the only person who had some was one small boy. These people were poor and they were hungry and they were ready to eat. And Jesus was able to fill every single one of them to the brim with everything that they could eat with that two fish and five loaves. So what is he trying to teach us with this miracle? What are we, what was Jesus trying to show his disciples? First and foremost, Jesus is showing his disciples that no matter the size of the problem or the intensity of the difficulty, no matter how crumbled their previous standard foundations of security had come, Jesus had no boundaries and he had no limits for his power. So how does that apply for our context today? There's a lot of fear in the world right now. You feel it. I feel it. We all feel it. The vast majority of our conversations that we have center around what is going to happen because of the coronavirus. We saw how the disciples handled things when they felt like their situation was out of control. How are we going to handle things when our world feels like things are out of control? Jesus wanted his disciples to understand And he wants us today to understand that as we read this story, we should be blown away by his ability to provide for us. Jesus created the world. He created the sun. He created the moon. He created the stars, right? He created the fish in the sea and the trees in the forest. He causes the rivers to flow and he causes hearts to beat. He causes eyes to see and ears to hear. He is the creator of all things. How insignificant of a miracle for him to be able to feed 25,000 people with a couple of fish and five small loaves of bread. What Jesus wants us to see in that is if he can provide for all of those people, if he can create the sun, the moon, the stars, and the world, then he can provide for us. Jesus wanted us to see, and he wanted us to feel in our bones that even when we are faced with the unknown, that he is able. And that story uh, is inspired or, or is written to us to inspire us, to, to have us be excited, to help us to know that we have encouragement, even in the midst of troubling times, that Jesus is able, and that there is no fear too great or problem too big that we can't trust it to Jesus. That's the truth of this passage, and it's a tremendously encouraging part of this passage. And we are meant to be fired up when we are reminded of God's miraculous power that we see him feed the 25,000 people with a couple of fish and five loaves of bread. So when we take a look at the crowd that day, we can see that they were a group of people that, that got it. They understood the significance of what Jesus was doing. They were fired up. Look at verse 14. It says, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which Jesus has performed, they said, Truly, he is the prophet who is to come into the world. But Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. So we see a couple interesting things in the, the last two verses of this section here. First, we see that the crowd knew that something big was happening. And when the passage said the people believed that this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world, they were referencing a passage all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, which was a prophecy that there would be another prophet to come who would be just like Moses, who would deliver the people of of Israel away from the bondage of their enemies. The problem is that Moses lived 1,700 years before Jesus. This group of people had been waiting a long time for the prophet to come. And now here they are, standing in a grassy field, 
And there is a man who is providing bread for them, just like Moses provided bread for the Israelites in the wilderness. So the people see and understand this man is the king. But we also see in in verse 15 that there was something that this group of people was, was missing. Because even though they recognized that he was a king, they recognized that he could provide for their needs, the king that Jesus truly was wasn't the king that they were expecting, and he wasn't even the king that they really wanted. They believed that Jesus was the king who had come to meet their physical needs. Perhaps they wouldn't have to be hungry anymore. Perhaps they wouldn't have to struggle under bondage to a foreign ruler. Jesus was supposed to be the king that would guarantee them a lifetime of full bellies. If you walk away this morning and the main thing that you take away from this passage is that God can provide for your needs, your physical needs, I failed in presenting to you the most important part of this passage. You see, most of the people in the crowd weren't pursuing Jesus because they wanted Jesus. They were pursuing Jesus because they wanted the stuff that Jesus gives. They are placed right here in the story to give us a cautionary tale. And so as we continue to look forward, we can look in in 26 and we can see that the people come back for another meal. Jesus answered them and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs but because you ate of the loaves because you were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but work for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. When Jesus says this to them, he's addressing the same crowd that he had fed just the previous day before. And they're coming back to Jesus, not because they're interested in him, not because they want to know more about him, not because they, they want to follow him for him. They're, they're coming back because they're looking for another meal. They're coming back simply because they want their physical needs met. This idea uh, of going to Jesus in order to have your needs met is not an unfamiliar idea in our world today either. It's called the prosperity gospel. And it's the idea that if you follow God, he's going to give you whatever you want. Do you want a happy family and healthy kids? Follow God. Do you want to be prosperous? Follow God. Do you want to have health? Follow God. But that message is one of of charlatans and philanderers because that is a message that gets people to follow after God, not because they want more of God, but because they want more of God's stuff. And what Jesus is clearly saying in that passage is, but that is completely missing the point of why Jesus did the miracle to feed those 5,000 people. The prosperity gospel doesn't know what to do with the pain and the suffering that, that we experience in life. And it certainly doesn't know what to do when we go through something like the coronavirus. What we're called to see in this passage is that Jesus didn't come so that we would have bread. He came so that he could be bread. He didn't come to the earth to satisfy our fleshly desires. He came to the earth to satisfy our souls. And he didn't come so that we could rejoice in his stuff. He came so that we could rejoice in him. One of my favorite all-time quotes, regardless of book or or author, is a quote from C.S. Lewis that I'm sure is familiar to many of us, but is a great reminder as we're considering these truths today. C.S. Lewis said, We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea, we are far too easily pleased. The last line of, of that statement is the one that I really want to focus on this morning as we think about what is the meaning for the feeding of the 5,000 and and why should we trust in Jesus is the fact that as people so commonly, we are far too easily pleased. And if we are pleased only with Jesus' stuff instead of Jesus, then we are completely missing the point. 
Your friends, don't fall into the same trap as that crowd. Don't settle by being satisfied with God's gifts when the only thing that satisfies is God himself. The crowd came back looking for Jesus for a meal as we just read. And a few verses down the road, we'll see after Jesus' uh, next comments to them about these things, they leave deeply disappointed. Do you know who did get it in this message? Those same disciples who struggled earlier on in this passage. I want you to look with me all the way at the end of chapter 6. It says, Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? And the twelve said, Simon Peter answered him, he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Your words are eternal life. We have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We give the disciples a, a hard time often because they don't seem to understand the truths of Je- that Jesus is teaching. But this time, they get it. They understand and they say that we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So what is the message that Jesus is trying to teach us with the feeding of the 5,000 is he's trying to answer this question of can we trust him? John Piper answers that question this way. He said, Jesus is opening the window on his glory, not that we might get excited about how useful he might be in getting what we already wanted, but that we might see that he himself is better than anything that we ever wanted. Jesus is our provider. And as he reaches out his hand to us in the midst of this crisis that we're facing today, he's asking us this question, do you trust me? He's asking us not to trust in his gifts, but he's asking us to trust in him. He's a savior of our soul. He's a creator of the world. And he is a worthy foundation for us to place our trust. Let's pray. Dear Father, in these uncertain times, we face a world that is filled with fear. And we face a world that has been turned upside down and and shaken to its core. But God, we thank you that because of your Son, we don't have to be filled with fear. We worship you, the Creator, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And Father, I pray that this season would be one that deepens our dependence and our trust in you and in you alone. I pray that this is a season that we discard the rotting foundations where we have previously placed our trust and we are prone to place over our trust and that we learn to take your hand and follow after you. Not for the gifts, Father, but because you are the giver. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your word and we thank you, Lord, for the truths that it provides. I pray that you allow them to sink into our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name I pray.